What's going on friends? It is no secret that Harley's FXR was one of the best handling Harleys ever created. And some may even argue that this thing was as good, if not better, than the modern Softail. If you don't know what the FXR is, well, in short, the FXR is one of the best handling Harley-Davidson motorcycles to ever carry a big twin engine. Honestly, even better handling than the Sportster just because of the construction of its frame, which the construction of its frame would eventually lead to the FXR line being canceled. So the question is, why should you buy an FXR? But before we get into that, please don't forget to drop a like on the video if you enjoy it, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Normally, Sporty with the big twin engine and Harley-Davidson have never really gone together, but today we have the Sport Glide, we have the Lowrider S, and we have the Fat Bob all in that new Softail platform. So Harley-Davidson has really made some improvements as far as maintaining their classic big air-cooled V-twin and making a little bit more sporty, better handling motorcycles. These are some of the absolute best handling motorcycles in Harley-Davidson's lineup today. And you can cruise on these, you can tour on these, heck, you can do just about anything you want to do with these new Softail motorcycles. The problem is the new Softail motorcycles are just super expensive. So naturally, if you want something with good handling characteristics that's still kind of sporty, you turn to a used Dyna, which is quite a bit less expensive than the new Softail bikes. As good as the Dyna platform is, it just doesn't compare to the frame rigidity and the handling that is offered with an FXR. FXRs have really gained a lot of popularity, and if you happen to just find one that's pretty much stock, they're really not much to look at by today's modern styling standards. But Harley has always been about customization, and there are guys out there doing some really awesome things with these FXRs. They are just pretty much unrecognizable from their bone stock form. So what makes the FXR so much better than the Dynaline when it comes to handling? Well, it all starts with the frame. They don't use a lot of cast steel parts. When it comes to the FXR frame, they use a lot of cast steel and welded parts. It's no surprise the FXR is handled so well when you have Eric Buell in on the design team, bringing his years of road racing and engineering experience to the table to get these frames built. The FXR was considered an engineer's bike by Harley-Davidson as these motorcycles, basically the frames, had to be hand assembled because there were so many intricate welds to be done on the frames. Now keep in mind, this was back in the day before there was robotic welding, so everything was done by hand when it came to constructing these frames. Details like a higher seat height, higher pegs, this meant that this bike you could take it out and not just cruise on it, but with the increased lean angle, you could really get out there and have some fun on these FXRs. The FXR takes the narrowness of the Sportster and incorporates that with a big twin engine. Not everyone can fit on a Sportster, and the FXR takes that narrowness of the Sportster, but uses a larger frame, the legendary Evo engine, and some suspension. Not to mention, these bikes have a rubber-mounted engine with a 5-speed transmission which is a huge plus for reduced vibration when it comes to a rigid mounted Sportster. Even today, the FXR maintains a very strong following, and a lot of the followers, they will still claim that it is the absolute best Harley ever built. Which, arguably, might be a little hard to justify with the advancements that Harley has made here in the recent years when it comes to engine technology, suspension, and chassis. Now, the FXR was a favorite of a lot of motorcycle clubs that may or may not have been involved in some business that might require some quick getaways. Now, if that lends any credibility to the bike's handling capabilities, I'll let you guys decide. Early generation FXRs were originally equipped with the 80-inch shovelhead engine, and then a little later on, they started outfitting them with this rock-solid Evo engine, which the Evo is going to be the more common FXR you're going to run across. If you do find a shovelhead FXR, be prepared to pay for it because you don't see a lot of them these days. So if the FXR was such a great bike, you might really be wondering, why did it go out of production? Well, simply put, it was just expensive to produce, and at the time, people just weren't really buying that sportier model. The FXR was just really ahead of its time. Harley-Davidson began looking for an easier platform to build on, so they kind of scrapped the FXR and started work on the Dyna. 
which the Dyna was going to have a lower suspension and more rake to the front end. And this is really what the market was going for at that time. Sales of the FXR really probably likely slumped at that time because there was more related to the import motorcycles and not a lot of people were interested in those import bikes at that time. Everybody wanted a Harley. But for sure, don't kid yourself that in any way these bikes were unreliable. They had that rigid frame and they were powered by the rock solid Evo engine so you could really lay some miles down on an FXR if you wanted to. Former Wisconsin Senator Dave Zine rode his 1991 FXRT to 1 million miles. <laughs> now, <laughs> at 1 million miles, let's just say the bike was not in perfect shape and no, it was not done on the original engine. The original engine was rebuilt 10 times on this 1 million mile journey and about the last leg of that million miles that original engine actually had to be replaced with a new Evo crate engine just simply for the fact that there was so much metal fatigue on the engine mounts they couldn't bolt it back in the bike but in the 90s the FXR gave way to the Dyna but it wasn't dead forever the FXR did come back in 1999 and in 2000 in very, very limited production numbers in what would be later become the CVO models. These are some extremely rare FXR bikes, as in 1999, they only produced 900 of them, and then in the year 2000, they only produced 1,000 of these bikes. So they are very limited run, very hard to find. So if you are lucky enough to own one of these FXRs, keep it. If you're lucky enough to have an opportunity to buy one, take it. Finding an FXR that's pretty close to stock might be pretty hard these days, but the FXRs did come in more of a cruiser type model and also in a touring version. The fairing on the touring model was actually right off the Nova project, and if you haven't heard about the Nova project, it's a pretty interesting story, and Harley-Davidson could have looked a lot different than what it does today. But you can check that video out right here. FXRs are extremely popular today. There's a lot of people buying them up. And if you can find one used, it might run you a little bit more. It might cost you a little bit more. But these bikes are going to have all kinds of top-end, high-end goodies on them. Now, albeit they will command some more money over a run-of-the-mill Dyna, but in the end, they're still a heck of a lot less money than a brand new Softail. The FXR is a bike for you if you're looking for something that you can cruise on, but you can still get out, run some corners on it, and have a good time with. The FXR is truly a Harley legend, and its desirability today is just a testament to that. Well guys, that is all I've got for you this week. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. Well guys, that's all I have for you this week. Please be safe on the streets, dodge those cars, and I'll see you guys right back here next week. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.